Good evening. My name is Trey Carson. I'm in economics and business at Hampton City College. And I'm going to talk to you about how malaria prevention is local. We often think about malaria prevention as this awful global public health problem. It is. But we often think the solutions to that kind of global public health problem are global in, in stature. And again, what I want to think about today is how it's local. So you probably have never heard of Leland Howard, of uh, William Bryan, of uh, Martha Claghorn, and uh, uh, Edward Poole. These are people who have found innovative discoveries to control mosquito populations and prevent malaria. We often don't think about the individuals who find these kind of discoveries, uh, especially in light of vaccines and other kind of uh, clinical and medical solutions here. These are just as important, I think. Um, this takes on a little bit different meaning uh, as of about 24 hours ago, uh, the World Health Organization finally approved a, a vaccine for malaria. So again, vaccines are an incredibly important part of ways to help mitigate the spread of malaria. But Martha Claghorn and Gould and William Bryan and Leland Howard, they were acting about 100 years ago, and they weren't resting. They weren't saying, ha, ah, you know, where is the vaccine? They did something. They figured out innovative solutions to the problem here. And that's what I want to talk about. That's what I think is really interesting here, right? Ways to prevent infectious diseases, whereas we might not have uh, other kind of acceptable public health measures. All right, now I'm an economist. So what I'm thinking about here, we got to think a little bit about economics. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna get into a little bit of that. It's not gonna be difficult, it won't be painful, but that's gonna be a really neat way to think about the incentives here. Right? So the individuals here who are responding to malaria face some interesting incentives and that's what I wanna highlight. That's what I mean when I think about malaria prevention being local. So we'll talk about that, we'll talk about some stories and we'll, we'll wrap up. All right, so Leland Howard is an entomologist. He's started his career going around trying to figure out you know, what's the best kind of mixture, what's the best solution to sprinkle in stagnant bodies of water to stifle the mosquito breeding cycle, right? So we can stop that, right, in Leland's mind. That's a way to cut out mosquitoes, prevent them from spreading, things like that. So he's going around in the 1890s trying to figure out how much, how much kerosene, how much oil to sprinkle into ponds, trying to get the right mixture. He happens upon a family in the Catskill Mountains. And unbeknownst to them, they, they've got all these mosquitoes. They don't know where the mosquitoes are breeding and they're, 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 they're burdened by these mosquitoes. So he gets, they get in contact with Leland Howard. He you know, talks to them a little bit, looks around. Right? There aren't clearly uh, streams and stagnant bodies of water around. So he keeps searching. He finally realizes that underneath the porch of their house, they had a, a rainwater basin. And it was just alive with larva and mosquitoes. Right? Those are his words. And so what does he do? He sprinkles the kerosene, he sprinkles some oil, and their mosquito problem is kind of resolved. Leland Howard becomes famous for those kinds of experiments. People were writing him throughout the country and trying to, you know, hey, get good advice and, and get some his expertise. So again, that's just one example here where Leland was trying to experiment. He was trying to pursue his own knowledge, trying to advance his career, trying to understand the science of, uh, of the chemical properties that, uh, that stop the mosquito cycle. William Bryant and his son owned the Monoweezy Hotel in Brantford, Connecticut. We don't know really uh, of the Monoweezy Hotel because it isn't, uh, it isn't around anymore. But at the time, throughout the 20th century, that is, throughout the early 20th century, it became a, um, a renowned resort. People like Mark Twain stayed there. So at some point in time, the Monoweezy Hotel became really a really popular destination. And the 1900s, early 1900s, it wasn't. So what, what happened? Well, William Bryan realized you know, if, if there are customers coming to the, to the, the resort here, they're not going to be too happy if there are all these mosquitoes, all these other pests. 
So again, right, he has an incentive here. He faces an incentive to go around training streams, making sure they're straight, getting rid of stagnant bodies of water, clearing it from debris and things like that. So again, right there, that is again another example here of malaria prevention being local. Martha Clackhorn, again in the early 1900s, was walking around in the Richmond Hill area of New York. And she thinks to herself, you know, I'm really trying to make my community better. I'm trying to improve the quality of life. I'm trying to make our neighborhood prettier, among other things. And she happens upon a pamphlet from the London uh, School of Tropical Medicine at the time. It was about mosquitoes and how they spread malaria. And so again, she gets this information. She learns more about how to prevent mosquitoes. And she starts a community-wide campaign to clean you know, up your yard, right? If your yards are full of cans and, and other kinds of trash and debris that collect water that then help spread mosquitoes and that carry diseases, that's going to be something we can think about. That's going to be a way for our community to get rid of the problem. And that's exactly what she does, right? So um, she was also an officer of the 20th Century Club, as it was called. And again, this was the organization that helped to make Richmond Hill a pretty nice place. And so this program became successful. People, again, were writing to her saying, gosh, you know, I've lived in this area all my life, and I've never seen it so free of mosquitoes. So again, this is another example here. Edwin Gould was an entrepreneur, a businessman. He owned railroads in Texas. He owned the South, Southwestern, St. Louis Southwestern Railway, operated in Texas, uh, in Arkansas, and Missouri. And one day, he again kind of comes to this realization that there's a problem with mosquitoes, there's a problem with malaria in particular. He's looking at the hospital register. It's not just that there are a ton of people in the hospitals, they all have malaria, or a great many of them have malaria. So what he starts to do is set a plan in place to change the local ecology, right? to change the natural environment, to prevent mosquitoes from taking, taking hold in the first place. He sets aside money in a trust, finance the efforts. He hires sanitary engineers to, again, survey the, the, the area. He hires other people to start a sanitation department. So again, in this way, we realize there's a problem. Gould realizes there's a problem. He, he does things about it. Right? He takes the steps to, uh, to control the local mosquito population. So all of these stories, and there are more, there are other examples of individuals responding to malaria and to the mosquito problem. There are other examples of businessmen, businesswomen, realizing, hey, look, if, if we get rid of this, these mosquitoes and this malaria problem, we might be able to earn additional revenue. There are additional examples of associations realizing that their lives, their lives with others, are better off if the association if the club can do something about it. So all of these examples are things I think are really important here. Again, in the context where we don't have adequate public health service or we don't have a viable vaccine, right, these might be some of the only ways people have to respond to the problem. So what are the implications here? If we think people are responsive, if we think malaria prevention is local, I want us to think that individuals have a wider scope. They have a wider scope to respond to malaria. Again, it's an awful problem. It's a global public health crisis, but there are ways individuals can respond. And even more so once we start thinking about the individuals, the communities they are a part of, and the firms right, that are in those communities as well. So individuals have a much larger scope that we can often give them credit. Now, look, the fact that malaria prevention might be local or, or we might be doing it as local doesn't mean everyone's going to uh, have access to this. There are places in the world where governments are dysfunctional, where government policies discourage a lot of entrepreneurial activity or they discourage association. So unfortunately, in a lot of those places, right, malaria prevention can't be local. But I think their response isn't to uh, push down ways of thinking about how individuals can respond it should be to encourage that kind of response. Rather, it should be to highlight 
bad policies that discourage individuals from taking, uh, taking the appropriate response as they, as they see it. So again, you might think that uh, the fact that malaria prevention is local isn't gonna get us much. Is it actually gonna influence uh, malaria in a, in a significant way? Well, in the examples we talked about, we can look at the effect on individuals, right, an individual home, right, that's pretty small, local scale, but we can ramp that up to a community level, right, so neighborhoods are now can be involved. At the same time, the St. Louis Southwestern Railway and other firms are operating across state lines. So there is a great deal of potential here for individuals and for local prevention here to be an effective response. So again, if you're worried about scalability, we want to keep thinking about how to encourage local prevention. So to close, local prevention depends on incentives. It's kind of the, the entire idea. And those incentives come in the form of individuals responding to the costs and benefits as they face them. It depends on the presence of associations, the presence of firms. And so as those incentives come online, as they change, right, we can expect to see changes in uh, local prevention. So there's a lot here. There's a lot here. I've only told you about four cases, right, from the United States in the early 1900s. There's a lot more history here. We've been dealing with malaria for thousands of years. So at the very least, I hope you have learned something interesting. And to the extent you're curious, I hope I've given you a little bit more of an idea as to how to start thinking about uh, malaria prevention economics and how their prevention is local. Thank you.